Hi everyone. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about the second chapter, proofs, and we're going to start this chapter by section 2.1, logical reasoning. In this section, we are going to talk about the arguments and uh, the elements of an argument, which are hypothesis and conclusion. Also, we are going to talk about uh, how to prove or disprove the uh, validity of an argument, how argument is valid or invalid. Uh, first, we start with defining an argument and its elements. An argument is a sequence of propositions called hypothesis, followed by a final proposition called the conclusion of the argument. So, as you see in this figure, there are n plus one positions. The first n propositions, p1, p2, all the way to pn, are called the hypothesis of the argument, and they are followed by a horizontal line, and then we have three dots in the form of a triangle, which we call it uh, therefore, that's a symbol for the word therefore, followed by C, which is another proposition, the final proposition of the sequence of um, propositions in an argument, the conclusion of the argument. So we have N propositions uh, followed by a conclusion. The first N propositions are called hypothesis of the argument. The last one is called the conclusion. And it's important to know that we can have as many propositions as we want in, a, in an argument. However, we should have one and only one conclusion in one argument. It's important to know that an argument is valid if the conclusion is true whenever the hypothesis are all true. Otherwise, the argument is invalid. In other words, you can say an argument is valid if and only if this conditional statement is a tautology. What does it mean? The conditional statement says if P1, the first proposition, the first hypothesis, and P2, the second one, all the way to Pn, the last hypothesis of the argument. Therefore, C, which means if all the hypotheses are all true, then the conclusion has to be true. Therefore, if this conditional statement is a tautology, that means that the argument is valid. According to the cum commutative law that we saw in the first chapter, by reordering the hypothesis, we are not going to change the validity of an argument, which means that in this group conjunction, if you change the order of P1, P2, all still have the same truth value for this conditional statement, which means that by reordering P1, P2 all the way to Pn, uh, if the conditional statement was a tautology, it will be a tautology. And if it, is, if it wasn't a tautology, it will remain not a tautology. So remember, the order of Hypothesis in an argument doesn't matter. So based on the definition of validity of an argument that have provided in the previous slide, here I'm going to show you an example of how to prove the argument. The argument that we are going to talk about in this is if P then Q, as the first hypothesis, this junction of P and Q as the second hypothesis, and the conclusion in this argument is, as you see, we have three propositions. Two of them are hypothesis. The last one, 
is the conclusion. We have two variables participating in all of these three propositions. Therefore, if you want to participating in this argument, we need four rows. P and Q need four rows because there are four combinations of their truth values. In the first row, P and Q. In the second row, P is true, but Q is false. In the third row, Q is true, but P is false. In the last row, both P and Q are false. We construct a column for the first uh, hypothesis, which is if P then Q. As you see in this hypothesis, in this column, the truth value of the first third and last row are true. The truth value of the second row is false. Then we have another column for the second hypothesis, which is the disjunction of P and Q. In this column, we have all true at the last row in which P and Q are both false and therefore their disjunction is also false. And after constructing the two columns for the two hypotheses, we need another column for the conclusion. In this case, because the conclusion is only Q, you don't need to construct a new one. The second column is Q itself. So we have three columns for the three propositions in this argument. The next step is to look at each row and see whether both hypotheses are true at the same time or not. If there's a row in which both hypotheses are true, that row is called the critical row. If you have more hypotheses, then all hypotheses have to be true if you have a if you want to have a critical row in your truth table. In this case, the first and third rows are critical rows because both hypotheses are true. The second row is not a critical row because if P then Q is false. The last row is critical row because the disjunction of P and Q is false. In the next step, it's important to know this rule which says an argument is invalid if and only if you can find a critical row in its truth table with false conclusion. If you cannot find any critical row with false conclusion, then you can say the argument is valid. In this example, since both the first and third rows, which are critical rows, have true value for Q, which is our conclusion. Therefore, you can say this argument is valid. If, for example, one of the conclusion, then you, we had to say that the argument is not valid. Next, we define the form of an argument. The form of an argument expressed in English is obtained by replacing each individual proposition with a variable, which means that present each sentence, each proposition with a variable to find the form of that argument which is expressed in English. Let's see an example and see what the form of the following argument is. This example that you see has three sentences has three propositions. The first two are obviously the hypothesis of the argument and which is specified by three dots is called the conclusion of the argument. What is the first hypothesis? The patient has high blood pressure or diabetes or both. The second one says the patient has diabetes or high cholesterol or both. 
The conclusion says the patient has high blood pressure or high cholesterol or both. So in order to find the form of this argument, we need to represent the patient has blood pressure with a symbol like B as boy. The second uh, statement, the patient has diabetes can be represented by D and the third participating individual proposition, which is the patient has high cholesterol can be represented by C, uh, the three letters of alphabet. So the form of argument would be the first hypothesis is the disjunction of B and D because we says we say high blood pressure or diabetes or both. The second one is the disjunction of D and C because we said diabetes or high cholesterol or both. And the conclusion is the disjunction of B and C. Now that we have found the form of this argument, I'm gonna prove that this argument is invalid. Why? I'm going to show you that there is a critical row in which the conclusion is false. The critical row, if you draw the, uh, if you construct the truth table, the critical row that I'm talking about is uh, when B and C are false and D is true. Why this is a critical row? Because both the hypotheses are true in this case. B or D would be true because D is true. D or C is true because, again, D is true. However, in, the, in this critical row, the conclusion is false. What is B or C? And both B and C are false propositions. Therefore, the conclusion is false, but both hypotheses are true, which means that there is a critical row in which the conclusion is false. That means the argument is invalid. In this slide, you will see a na the name and uh, rule of inference of a number of famous uh, uh, that are true, and you can use them whenever you want. These arguments uh, can be seen to be valid uh, in a very, very simple proof. All you need to do is to construct the truth table for all the propositions participating in these arguments and see that there is no critical role with false conclusion. So the first or the first famous argument that we're gonna use a lot in this chapter is called modus ponens. And if P is true and P then Q is true, therefore Q should be true. So it has two hypotheses, P and if P then Q, and one conclusion, which is Q. The second one is modus tollens, which says if Q is false in the first hypothesis, not Q. And in the second hypothesis, if P then Q, the conclusion would be not P, negation of P. You can also so this argument is valid very easily. This third one is called the addition rule of inference, which says if P is true, then the disjunction of P and Q is true for any proposition Q. Basically, this small argument has only one hypothesis and one conclusion. The, Fourth one is called sim, which says if the conjunction of P and Q is true, therefore P has to be. The fifth rule of inference is conjunction, which says if P is true in the first hypothesis and Q is true in the second hypothesis, therefore the conjunction of P and Q is true. That's maybe the obvious, the most obvious one. 
The next argument is called hypothetical syllogism, which has two if P then Q and if Q then R, the conclusion would be if P then R, which transitivity of conditional relation between individual propositions. The next one is called disjunctive syllogism, which basically says in the first hypothesis if the disjunction of p and q is true and in the second hypothesis p is false or not p negation of p then q has to be true the conclusion is q the last rule of inference is called in the resolution we say if the disjunction of p and q is true and the disjunction of is true therefore q or r has to be true so all the propositions are first one says disjunction of p and q second one disjunction of not p and r is the disjunction of q and r you can also prove this one by constructing a truth table with eight rows and see that in all the critical rows, the value of the conclusion is true. We can use the rules of in to show the validity of an argument. So sometimes you don't need to construct a truth table for an argument to show, or it would be very hard and uh, uh, time consuming to construct a truth table for a for an argument to check the validity because we have many participating variables and you have to draw a huge truth table therefore we will use the rules of inference that we have proven them individually so this is an example with three hypotheses and one conclusion the first hypothesis is if the disjunction of p and r is true then q and t third one is r so as you see we have four variables of t uh, these variables will create 16 rows in the truth table of this and so it is very time consuming to construct the truth table for this the large argument and uh, prove but you can simply use the rules of inference to prove the validity of this uh, argument we start with the fact that the third uh, hypothesis is true so in the first sentence of this logical proof is r is true based on the third hypothesis Second sentence says, based on addition rule of inference, since R is true, therefore the disjunction of P and R has to be true. In the third sentence, we write the first hypothesis. If P or R, then Q. Now, based on the second and third rule of inference, and say, therefore, Q has to be true. Now, based on the second hypothesis, we know that Q implies T. Since Q is true and Q implies T, based on modus ponens, you can conclude that the conclusion T must be true. So as you see, we use modus ponens rule of inference twice and we use the addition rule of inference to prove that this argument is valid so that's called the logical proof here we talk about the third section of chapter two rules of inference with quantifiers we first define uh, some terminologies 
an element is a value that can be plugged in for variable x uh, and it has to be in the domain of variable x then we define the word arbitrary an arbitrary element of a domain has no special properties other than those shared by all the elements of the domain so when we say arbitrary element it means it has no special property it can be any element in the domain when we say particular when we say a particular element of the domain we may uh, we mean that it has some properties that are not shared by all the elements of the domain and that we define here is called existential instantiation instantial instance instantiation and universal instantiation replace a quantified variable with an element of the domain so if that quantified variable is an existentially quantified variable this operation instantial instantiation if that quantified variable is a universally quantified variable, this operation is called universal instantiation. Then we define another term, which is existential generalization and universal generalization. And universal generalization replace an element of the domain with a quantified variable so if the quantified variable that is in this uh, operation the variable we call this operation a universal generalization if this quantified variable is an existentially quantified variable we call this generalization an existential generalization if you haven't completely understood this these definitions it's fine because we're going to show some examples in the next slides first let's take a look at a universal instantiation example here is the uh, the general form the main rule if c is an element either arbitrary or particular and we have a universally quantified statement for every x p of x we can conclude that p of c is true the c is an element is an arbitrarily or uh, particularly chosen element of the domain matter in any case p of c has to be true because we have a universal statement in the second hypothesis of this argument an example of this rule of inference is this in the first type in the first hypothesis argument we say sam is a student in the class in the second one we say every student in the class completed the assignment and the conclusion is therefore Sam completed his assignment. In the second rule of inference, we have a universal generalization example. In this rule of inference, two hypotheses. The first one is C is an arbitrarily chosen element of the domain for X. And one says, p of c is true p is a predicate so p of c is true the con conclusion is uh, the quantified statement for every x p of x has to be true here we have a generalization c is arbitrarily chosen and p of c is true so for every element in the domain uh, p of x true let's see an example in the first hypothesis we have let's see be an arbitrarily 
chosen integer. In the second hypothesis, we say C is less than or equal to C squared. Therefore, every integer is less than or equal to its square. And, uh, you know, we are done with this argument because we created a general rule for every integer. In the third rule of inference that we see here, we're going to talk about instantiation. The existential instantiation argument has only one hypothesis, which is an existential, uh, existentially quantified statement there exists an X such that P of X. If we have this hypothesis, then we can conclude that there is a C, which is a particular element of the domain and uh, the predicate P is true for that C, right? This is basically the definition of existentially quantified statement. So, uh, as an example, you can consider uh, this uh, argument if we know that there is an integer that is equal to its square therefore c square is equal to c for some integer c the last rule of inference is existential generalization it has two hypotheses and one conclusion the first hypothesis says C is an element either arbitrarily chosen or particularly chosen. And we know that uh, the predicate P is true for C. Therefore, we can conclude that there is an X such that P of X. This is called existential generalization. Let's see an example. The first hypothesis is Sam is a particular student in the class. The second hypothesis is that the assignment. The conclusion is, therefore, there is a student in the class who completed the assignment. Here is an example of how to use the inference rules for you quantify the statements to uh, present a logical proof for an argument. Here is the argument. In the first hypothesis we have, for every x, p of x or q of x. The second one is three is an integer. The last hypothesis is p of three is false or negate. The conclusion that we are going to reach is Q of 3. How can we prove this? In the first statement, we say the first hypothesis is true. Therefore, for every X, P of X or Q of X. In the second statement, we write the second hypothesis. And then we use the first two sentences and universal instantiation rule of inference to say that either P of three is true or Q of three is true because three is an integer and we have a universally quantified statement for all integers. So the disjunction of P and Q has to be true for three. In the fourth statement, we write the third hypothesis, which is negation of P of three and then we use the third and fourth statements and the disjunctive uh, syllogism rule of inference to prove that q of 3 has to be true.